<laughs> well, welcome everyone to this All About Occupation seminar. My name is Danny Hitch and I'm co-convener of All About Occupation along with the amazing Bex Twinley. And we've got a fantastic session for you today. Uh, just first of all, I'll flag that we're recording the session. So the recording has started now. Um, you should have a little notice that asks you for consent up the top. And we will be asking people if they want to put questions into the chat, please do so. Um, as the questions come in, Genevieve's happy to answer them and we'll um, pose the questions and hopefully you'll get your, your answer. Oh, I'm sure you'll get your answer actually. Um, put in all the questions that you like because at the end, any that we don't get to, Genevieve's very graciously um, said that she would happily answer them for us afterwards and we'll make that available as well. So I'm saying hello from Melbourne and I just want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting and today I'm on Wathorong country. Uh, I believe Genevieve's on Wurundjeri country and these are two of the two Kulin nations and we acknowledge and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So we'll get on to the amazing presenter we have today. So Genevieve is a French-Canadian mental health occupational therapist and an academic living in Australia. She started working at Deakin University in 2007. She's passionate about understanding the impact of mental illness on engagement in meaningful occupations and advancing occupational therapy practice, education and research in mental health. Oh, Danny, I think you muted yourself. <laughs> Can't hear you. Oh, I, I don't know Eva and others, but I no, can't hear that me, No. <laughs> it's, I think it, it's showing that you're muted. How's that? Yeah, perfect. Do you know why? It's because my other screen turns itself off randomly and apparently it then mutes me. So now I know that. That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep going. Um, <laughs> So Genevieve's particularly interested in understanding the impact of eating disorders on function and the daily occupations of those with an eating disorder and their family and the development of innovative interventions promoting best health outcomes. She's a strong advocate for occupational therapy and mental health and eating disorders and for the unique role that we play in people's recovery. Strongly believes in multidisciplinary approaches and loves collaborating with others, particularly valuing the national and international collaborators that she works with, and there are many of them. Best practice and emerging knowledge that supports occupation-based and client-centred interventions are incredibly important to mental health and eating disorders. And with that, I will hand over to Genevieve. Her seminar today is entitled Occupational Therapy and Eating Disorders. Seriously, is it that hard to understand? Over to you, Jen. Thank you very much, Danny, for the very nice introduction. And I also want to say thank you for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk about something that I love. Um, and I want to welcome everyone. I know that for some of you it's very late, so I'll try to be as entertaining as I can. Um, and I, I suppose the timing for this um, seminar is also, is also quite quite nice and quite good because I just came back from an eating disorders conference in London uh, last week where there was, um, and it's a conference that I've been attending for quite a while now, it's every two years. And when I started attending in 20. 15 I think the first time I went there or 13 I was the only OT maybe another one I think at one stage just joined in and this year there was at least I met at least a dozen of OTs working in the field of eating disorders with OTs presenting and I think that yes Danny, I agree I was very excited and what I've observed as well is that we say that we're OTs more than we did before in the field of eating disorder anyway, as if it was, you didn't want, we didn't want to say that we're OTs because three quarters of the room would leave. Because if you're not a psychologist or if back then, now there's a bit of a shift, thankfully, but it just, it's a really nice shift and really, really nice movement in terms of acknowledging ourselves, acknowledging that we're OTs and the field of eating disorders being I'm going to say, I might be, might be controversial, um, finally acknowledging the role of OTs in the field of eating disorder. Um, I've worked as an, a mental health OT. I trained in Canada. Uh, I've worked as a mental health OT all my career. Um, 
And very early on, I became really interested in eating disorders because as a younger person, I did ballet for quite a while. And I remember this, there are events in, in our personal or professional life sometimes that just shape the choices that you make. And I remember when I was, I would have been about nine years old and there was a girl a bit older than me that I really looked up to who had gone to the National Ballet School of Canada and came back about a year a year and a half after, completely changed, physically exceptionally skinny. And I, all I remember is the, the feeling in the room when she came back. No one talked about anything. And, you know, nine-year-old, you don't really understand these things. But I remember thinking there is something wrong here. She's not herself. And everybody was sort of tiptoeing around her. And I it sort of stayed at the back of my mind, I think. And... When I did my, my undergrad degree in Canada uh, at McGill University in Occupational Therapy, I became more in interested in mental health than in perhaps other areas of OT. I started working in mental health uh, in a regional hospital, but I was in an acute psych ward. But because it was a regional town, I was doing a bit of everything. And then we started to see people with an eating disorder coming more and more. And that sort of reignited my, my interest about eating disorders and try to understand what it means and what we can do as OTs. And again, another event, I suppose, in, in my life and in my career that happened was this young woman. She would have been about 20 years old, just 20. I always worked most of the time with adults. Um, and she had a very severe clinical presentation of bulimia nervosa with quite a few psychiatric comorbidities as well. And as a whole team, the whole team, we were completely lost and didn't really know where to go and what to do. She was not really progressing. We had some, some OT goals about, you know, engaging in meaningful occupations, but it, it felt like it was just on the side of what we should have been doing. We were not really addressing the, the, the bulimia nervosa. I didn't really know what to do. And I just sort of reverted to my OT self and looked at the goals and said, look, I think we've achieved our goals and that's the end of my role here. So it's like, that's it. And that happened a really long time ago because I'm really old. But I do remember very, very clearly the look on her face when she said to me, that's it. And it's, I, I had to be honest and say, for me, it is. I, I don't know what else to do. And that something clicked in my head. And right after that session, I thought that there has to be more. I need to find a way to increase my knowledge and understand that thing that is eating disorders better. So I decided to leave my clinical practice and um, do my master's research because in Canada, you have to do a master's research before you can do a PhD. And it was really focusing on what are the needs of people with an eating disorder from an occupational therapy perspective and what can we do as OTs um, to support these people through their recovery. And I was really keen on having something that was hands-on that then I would go back to my clinical work and be better, I think a, a better OT, or I would feel better about my clinical practice, which I did. But then I thought, I actually quite like research. And I think I want to go back and do a PhD and understand better even more because then I started working with families and there was a lot going on in the literature around family that I started to uncover a bit when I was doing my master's. So then I decided to leave completely the clinical, my clinical role and then just, just, and then become an academic and do more research. So all this to say that the vast majority of my research is around eating disorders, like Danny was saying in the, in the introduction. Um, a lot of it is also working with families, but working with families, with carers, but understanding that family dynamic and how this interrelationship, like if something, it's a systemic thing, isn't it? Like if you do something with a person with eating disorder, it's going to have an impact on the family and vice versa. So that's the type of thing that I'm, I'm really interested in. So I've, I've organized my presentation and when I was preparing this slide, there were so many things I wanted to put in there and then I kept reminding myself, it's an hour, you're going to have to stop talking, people are going to have questions, just calm down. So I, I sort of made a selection of things that hopefully you're going to find interesting. 
like Danny said, you can interrupt me at any time. Uh, if you have questions, you can get in touch with me as well if you want to know more, because I feel like it's a bit of a snapshot of everything that we can do as OTs um, in the field of eating disorders. So the plan that I have is to, I will talk about eating disorders, even if I'm, I'm assuming that we have a bit of, all have a bit of knowledge about what eating disorders are, but there are a few things that I want to highlight and then bring the impact on function and occupation um, when we're thinking about eating disorders. Then I want to talk about the contribution of occupational therapy to the field of eating disorders using different studies. And I, I chose, I chose studies that we, that uh, we did at Deakin University where I work with honours students because I thought it was nice to have that, um, I feel like seeing that fresh look on, on eating disorders and, and the, the, the passion that these students have and say, we will change the world. And they're just like really excited about making sure that OTs are heard and are part of this. So I thought it's really, it was a, a nice way of, of presenting fairly current views of, Australian new grads or, or um, students coming into the world of um, eating disorders. I'm going to identify a couple of areas of growth for occupational therapy, again, using the, these studies and adding a few other things as well. And I'll just finish with a quick um, summary and ideas in terms of future consideration and the call to arms to so all OTs working in the field of eating disorders. So when we talk about eating disorders, interest, one of the interesting things is that the new, um, the latest version of the DSM-5 talks about eating and feeding disorders, which is a switch, a shift from the, the, the historical way of saying eating disorders. So there is this idea of feeding disorder as well that's there. Interestingly, we still talk about eating disorders. The literature talks about eating disorders, even if we know that's eating and feeding disorders, we're not, we haven't moved away from calling that eating disorders. Um, but the definition proposed by the APA, the American Psych Psychology Association, is that eating and feeding disorders are persistent, a, a persistent disturbance of eating or eating related behaviors that result in the alterate, al altered, sorry, altered consumption or absorption of food that is signif that significantly impairs physical health or psychosocial functioning. My first complaint about this is that still it feels to me like it's a very medicalized approach or definition. It is about physical health and psychosocial functioning. But what about occupational performance? What about there's more than the psychosocial functioning. The ability to engage, meaningfully engage, and participate in meaningful occupation is actually significantly compromised. But still, we start to hear that, hear that a little bit more at conferences or a little bit in the literature, but still the definitions are still very medical model. Um, and the information that we have when we look at the, if we were looking at the, the breadth of the literature around eating disorders is really medical focused, which is, you know, would be nice to hear something else. So that's going to be part of my call to arms when I, I reach my last slide. Just looking at the different types of eating and feeding disorders, there are many. And I just wanted to add a few things in terms of anorexia nervosa. Um, it does, ha it has the highest mortality rate when we compare to all other eating disorders and all other psychiatric conditions. Um, and when we look at anorexia nervosa, about 80% are females. And I think, and, and my colleagues in the field of eating disorders feel that this is why there is so much emphasis, and I'm not saying that it's wrong, but there is so much emphasis on anorexia nervosa in terms of all the most of the research, the treatment, the money um, goes towards anorexia nervosa, understanding anorexia nervosa. It's also really, we know it's they're all very serious, but we also know that the suicide is up to 31 times higher in people with anorexia nervosa than the general population. So it's it can be quite scary and it's exceptionally serious. Then when we talk about bulimia nervosa, we have also a little bit of information in terms of the suicide, 7.5 times higher in people with bulimia nervosa than in the general population. And it's interesting, the, 
often, and there's not that much literature that explores the 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 what leads to suicide in uh, eating disorders. The little bit of information that we have with uh, bulimia nervosa is often linked with um, what is often characterized as a chaotic behavior. Like when you have bulimia nervosa and you have the binge episode, you eat, you eat, you eat, you eat, you eat, and then you, you act out. And then you that's the, the sort of the context in which many of the suicide attempts resulting in, in completed suicide occur where it seems to be a little bit different for people with anorexia nervosa. But like I said, we don't have a lot of information about the, the circumstances and the context around that. Um, and again, bulimia nervosa is about 70% uh, of people with, bul with bulimia nervosa are female. Binge eating disorder, interestingly, and that you, I have a, another slide just after this one that shows the, the percentage right, for the different eating disorders. Binge eating disorder is, unfortunately, I'm going to say, becoming, um, the numbers are really, really increasing. We've stored, it's it, it sort of stabilised around anorexia nervosa and bulimia a little bit. Overall, they're all increasing, but binge eating disorder has really increased significantly. But the funding, the research hasn't really followed. Um, and again, about... 57% of people with binge eating disorders are, are female. Then you have a, a whole other section of eating disorders that are often characterized as other eating and feeding disorders, where you have um, avoidant or restrictive food intake disorder, AFID, which is found more so in children and young people. But there's a little bit of literature that says we actually find that in older people um, so there's there's a bit of a, a concern, I would say, in terms of what is really ARFID and who has ARFID, and the clinical presentations are sometimes very tricky around that. And I would say, uh, unfortunately, it's often missed or, or labelled as um, difficult or picky eaters. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm such a picky eater, and then you miss a lot of the of the other symptoms and the literature agrees and has always agreed that the earlier there is a diagnosis the better the prognosis so it's it's a, becoming a problem with ARFID as well um, there's a little bit of evidence but not much what we know from an Australian perspective is that it's um, ARFID is found in about one in 300 people across Australia so it's a bit of a worry as well that one and we don't know a lot about it um, then there's pika, where people eat things that are not food, their hair, their nails. Um, we have rumination disorder, where people regurgitate and then eat back. Um, and then we have the unspecified uh, feeding or eating disorders and the other uh, specified eating, feeding and eating disorders. And these are the categories where um, some clients have said to me, or, or people with lived or living experience who take part in my studies, I say, this is the too hard basket. Like it, It's not anorexia, it's not bulimia. Oh, yes, it is, but maybe it isn't. So we don't know. So we just put that in there and no one does anything about it. So we're starting to hear in Australia anyway, and, and perhaps um, where you are working as well, we're starting to hear a bit of a concern from people with lived and living experience saying, I think I fit in, in this category and there's nothing for me. And what are you going to do about it? Because I need help as well. So that's a bit of the, the, the state that we're at at the moment. And when we look at the distribution here, you can see um, anorexia nervosa is about 3%. When you look at the, the, the distribution of the different disorders, 12% for bulimia nervosa, 47% for binge eating disorder is quite significant. And then you have the 38% for the other eating disorders. But the 47%, the binge eating disorder, is actually a real concern. And the, the, I feel like saying the nice thing is that that concern and the voice of carers and families and of people with living or lived experience of binge eating disorder is increasingly loud, which is actually quite nice to hear. Um, there, there is, and, and yeah, it is heard, so I think there are... In a few years from now, I think we're going to see a bit more evidence uh, and publications around binge eating disorders. Um, 
In terms of the precipitating factors or what leads or causes, whatever you want to call that, I, I thought it would be interesting to go through a few of those and add my own experience of having worked in this field for a very long time and how I've seen things changed. Um, social control influences the, the preference for thinness in women, especially in Western culture, as has always been present and is not really improving, I have to say. Um, what we're seeing a lot of is the impact of social media on the drive for thinness, uh, on body image, on the appearance and, and the shape as well. It's, to, it's the what the body should look like and where the curve should be and, and all of that as well. That's And I think we need to be mindful of um, how we approach social media because there are really some fantastic things about social media. There are other things that are not so great about social media. So there's a lot of work that's done in terms of increasing social media literacy in younger people to actually decrease or, or better equip young people to be able to protect themselves against what they're seeing on social media but social media remains a, a concern and the overall social um, cultural influence and and what's out there uh, low self-esteem has been um, a precipitating factor since i started working as an ot in a, in you know like several decades ago um, Childhood eating problems is it was identified, then it sort of disappeared, and then it's sort of coming back. Um, looking at that, and I think it might be sort of linked with the picky eaters or difficult uh, when when children are difficult and they don't want to eat certain things. So I think that's not a bad thing that that's sort of coming back in in the in the conversation that we're having. Trauma has always been there as well, and and. Um, the interesting thing about trauma is that it is considered one of the precipitating factors. And when you listen to stories of people who have been through an eating disorder, and especially when you listen to the stories of families who have been through the eating disorder of their loved one, who has recovered, and we could talk about recovery from eating disorder for hours. Um, but when you listen to the story, especially the story of the carers, they all describe post-traumatic stress disorder. The trauma of having seen their child being so unwell and feeling so helpless and useless and, and not knowing what they were supposed to be doing and always being afraid that they would do the wrong thing or be afraid that they would do the thing that would trigger and even more serious or, or bigger eating disorder is really related to that trauma. They talk about the trauma all the time. So it's, it's really interesting to look at trauma in that way, trauma-informed care in terms of the treatment, because there are some specific interventions, uh, and I'll mention them briefly later on, that can be actually quite traumatic for the person with the eating disorder and for the family members as well. So trauma, I think, is a, a really important thing to consider to research more to understand more and as I'll say a lot of us if not all of us are trained or at least have some training in trauma informed care so all the more reasons to have OTs in uh, eating disorder teams. Um, gender is it still even if things are changing a bit it's still mainly I'll say gender and ethnicity together it's mainly western white young women who have an eating disorder that's still it's still the bulk where most of the cases are but we if if we're thinking about maybe um in the 80s and 90s that would be almost everything would be teenagers and a little bit younger than teenagers and a little bit um after teenage years and now that sort of bell curve is sort of flattening there are people with an eating this diagnosed with an eating disorders who are five children at five, six, seven, nine years old is, is not surprising anymore, which is quite scary, I think. And it's the same the same thing on the other side of that bell curve. People in their 30s, 40s, 50s with an eating disorder, some diagnosed at that time, but the interesting um, and unknown part of it is, are these people having a severe and enduring eating disorder and they were misdiagnosed or just missed completely? So it's, it's hard to tell, but there is overall that sort of flattening of the curve, which is, 
I would say, quite scary as well, because when you're trying to work in the field of eating disorder, it's much more, pretty much all the interventions are targeted at, at teenagers or young adults. That doesn't work for a five-year-old and it doesn't work for a 30 or 40-year-old. The relationships that people have with their family members are very different at these different ages. And if we think about adults, um, mostly women, again, in their 40s or 50s, the relation the, their parents is not going to sit next to them and make sure that they eat their three meals a day plus six snacks. That's not how it works. And it's about understanding the impact on the relationship that these people have and how partners can help as well. So there's a another big chunk of research that needs to be done as well. Um, I have here biological pathways. Um, Cindy Bulick in the US is doing amazing work in terms of trying to understand and map the genome and understand the biological pathways that will inform staging models that are really based on the biology and um, to also target and tailor interventions as well. So there's amazing work that is um, done by her. If you're interested, just Google Cindy Bulick. There's going to be a ton of things that are going to uh, appear on your search. Um, and as she says herself and others have, have said as well, we need to be mindful when we talk about that because it's if we can identify a genome and a biological pathway, a clear one, it's going to be great. It's going to give us so many answers to so many questions. But we, we don't want to end up with people who, say, who are going to say, well, I can't do anything. It's in my genes. Nothing can be done for me. We don't want people who are not going to engage because it's hard enough for people to engage in treatment when they, they, they have an eating disorder. So we don't want to add that as another reason for refusing or resisting to engage in treatment. And we don't want to get people so discouraged that it's like, oh, my God, it's in my genes. There's nothing I can do. So it's about finding the right way. And, and Cindy Bullock is acutely aware of that. And she's really good at making that sort of transition and making sure that we don't fall in that trap of, of stigmatizing those that have that genome or biological pathways as well. But that's amazing research that she's doing. There are other, um, and I've grouped them, especially for anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa, perfectionism, impulsivity, obsessive thinking, and negative emotionality have been linked very strongly with anorexia nervosa and, and bulimia nervosa. But overall, what we can say and sum up this it's like i feel like saying eating disorders are like weeds hence my little photo they're just like spread 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 when i started being interested in eating disorders um the first thing that i started reading that would have been in the mid 1990s and it was white females in you know western world usually higher socioeconomic status now it's everywhere and i remember when i was doing my um studying my phd in the mid 2000s there were studies about eating disorders in asia where the sample sizes were three four five thousand and we were blown away by that thinking wow and interestingly what uh, these studies were telling us was that the socio-cultural influences from the US mainly back then um, had a significant impact. People, young women wanted to look like Jennifer Aniston in Friends. They wanted to have her body or they wanted to look like Courtney Cox in Friends. It's all these sort of TV shows where you had these very thin, slender young women and they wanted to look like them. So again, they have that whole way of, of trying to understand the influence that culture has and in, in all of that. One of the things in eating disorder that is significantly missing is the voice of and information about First Nations. There's almost nothing, almost nothing in there. And one of the things that I should have said before, um, and I, I should have put a link, and I'll, Danielle, I'll send you a link to that as well, is that in, in Australia, and I think there's another similar centre in the States, um, in Australia we now have the Australian Eating Disorder Research and Translation Centre. Uh, we were very excited to be funded uh, by the federal government to start that centre. We got $13 million over four years, and it's really about 
increasing research and translation of research. That's another problem that we have in the field, Might, probably not just in eating disorders, but research is not always translated. It's not always translated in a way that makes sense for clinicians like us. It's like, okay, if you talk to me about the animal models and, and biological pathways, how does that help me as a, as a clinician to actually support clients through their recovery? And the goal of the centre is really to increase research and increase the translation of that research in meaningful outputs. And the way that the, the, the centre is structured is there is... Um, great, Danny, thank you for that. There's um, different research, research streams and across all those streams, there is um, a lived experience and co-production stream that goes across everything that's going to be produced or that's going to be proposed and, and done in terms of study. And I'm the colleague of that lived experience and co-production um, stream that goes across everything. So that's actually quite interesting. And when we developed the centre together, a few of us, we also decided that we wanted to have a stream that goes across that was going to be focusing on First Nations to make sure that we enhance the research and, and we give these people a voice. Because food is very different. It, the relationship to food is very different. There's so many things that, that we don't know about with First Nations. And I would say, I think being from Canada, I would say it's the same with First Canadian in Canada with First Nations. And I'm perhaps making an assumption here, but I would say it's pretty much the same everywhere. We don't know enough and they're not involved and we don't have their voices and their stories. So hopefully in a few years from now, things are going to change and improve. So these um, precipitating factors, you have them here. And then if I go back a little bit in history, we know that eating disorders develop typically develop in adolescence, that the bell curve is sort of decreasing. But if we go back in history, because it started in with adolescent, the the medical world, and I'm when I say go back in history, this is these references here are about the late 70s to mid 80s. It, the causes of eating disorders were sort of fairly I'm, I'm hesitant to say easy, that would be a judgment call that I would make, but there were some causes that were clearer. For example, the pathogenic role of the family. I'm not going to expand on that. Just the, the fact that we're saying that families are pathogenic and have a pathogenic role, I think, speaks for itself. There used to be in the literature for quite a while work done um, about understanding the role of the family, but it was it felt like it was always the role of the family in starting the eating disorder and a bit blaming and, and finger pointing where you had controlled families lead to anorexia nervosa, chaotic families lead to bulimia nervosa. And it was very like you have here on this slide, like rigid families where the, ro the roles are blurred, but at the same time, very rigid, where there's overprotection, you will develop an eating disorder. You will have a child with anorexia nervosa. Not necessarily. Same thing with the chaotic families. The child is taking on the role of the parent because the parents are unable to be parents. Um, there is ambivalence in terms of the emotional support because the parents are not able to parent properly. Their child is going to have a, a bulimia nervosa. And that, yes, so that was in the literature and was quite problematic, as uh, you can imagine. And I would say up to mid-2000, I remember thinking that I might want to leave Canada and sort of explore the world and do research elsewhere. I will not name the country, uh, but I had, uh, I was invited to go somewhere overseas away from Canada and to teach. It was mainly to teach mental health um, in a newish occupational therapy course. And I said, well, I'm halfway or early, the first third of my PhD, that's what interests me. So I'm, I'm not going to go if I can't have support to continue my PhD. And um, after months and months of trying to find someone, and my PhD was really about carers, the role of carers, what we can do with carers, how we can support them, and then design um, a sort of a support group based on the model of human occupation. I followed them for um, a year. 
took a lot of measurements um, and also did a lot of interviews to create these stories and then try and figure out, does that have an impact on eating disorder symptoms of your loved one? But the people with eating disorder were like the secondary population group. I was interested in families. So after months and months and months and months of trying to find people who could supervise me or co-supervise me, I was invited to meet with a few psychiatrists who I think they meant well. I'm going to say that. I think they meant well, but they said, oh, shut up. I felt like they were telling me, oh, you're so cute, poor little thing. They said to me that it was, in terms of the family, it's really easy. So I was sort of wasting my time. You have a child with anorexia nervosa. They were not even talking about eating disorders. Some did, but it was, you have a child with anorexia nervosa, remove the child from the family, put the child in the hospital, refeed the child. The child is going to gain weight. Remove family completely while the child is in hospital. Take the child out of the hospital. Put the child back in family. Easy, Genevieve. Needless to say that I did not <laughs> take off that job. I came back to Canada and thought, no, I'm I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do my I'm going to continue my own study and my own PhD. And I suppose I was lucky, very lucky to have um, one of my supervisors was Gary Kilhoffner, and he was appalled. And I, I let you imagine the typical passionate American reaction when I had that conversation with him, which was absolutely lovely. But it was great to have his support as well and the support of my, my supervisors to actually continue my work, which I did. And when I finished, when you do your PhD, you finish, it goes into the world for um, international and, and domestic reviewers to provide feedback. And my PhD came back. Um, one of the external reviewers stopped reading at page 76 of like three, 400 something pages and had a, a very clear, that was the clearest comment I've ever received, I have to say and be honest, the clearest feedback I've ever received in the whole time that I did master's or PhD. And his comment was, this student should fail. First of all, this should have never happened. So the supervisors are wrong. And I should fail because uh, working with families is risky and dangerous because all they do is interfere with real treatment. So again, I will let you imagine the reaction of my dear American supervisor, Gary Kilhoffner, but the, the reactions of everybody, including my own, it's like, no, no. And it's as devastated as it was, um, it just gave me this, this blame, this desire to say, this is not happening. Comments like that cannot happen ever again. Um, and because of that, I think, I, was, I, I think I would have still maintained my interest in eating disorders, but because of that, um, I sort of started to really be focusing on the working with carers, and I found the wonderful, amazing, brilliant Professor Janet Treasure, who's at King's College in the UK, and all the work that she's done with carers to really understand how we can equip carers and they can become part of a team and collaborate. She's really strong, a strong advocate of collaborative um, approach and, and the role that we can play. So the, the whole idea of blaming the mums, the family, but also the mums, has completely disappeared. I can say, without a doubt, we can confirm that this is gone. And the work that we're doing with family now is absolutely amazing. And if you're interested in, in a bit more of that Janet Treasure, just look for Janet Treasure. She's absolutely wonderful. If you see her, go and say hi. She's amazing and she's doing fantastic work. She understands OTs and she loves OTs as well. So what's not to love about Janet Treasure? Um, I'm mindful of the time and I know I'm going to have to stop talking soon. I'll go quick. In terms of um, other sort of statistics or, or information that we that could be interesting in terms of understanding eating disorder is that global lifetime prevalence that we have here up to 8.4% in women, 2.2% in men. So that has increased quite a bit. If I have Australian statistics, over 1, 1 million people have been diagnosed with an eating disorder. It doesn't consider everybody who's not seeking treatment or everybody who's trying to seek treatment but can't find anybody to provide treatment, let alone a diagnosis. Um, 
And you have, interestingly, we say that, you know, one million people have an eating disorder, but we have very recent evidence that says one million people between the age of 16 and 85 have, have experienced binge eating disorder at one time in their life. So the numbers don't add up. There's much more people with an eating disorder than, than what the official numbers are telling us. Alarmingly, in 2018, in Australia, 95% of the um, hospitalization for eating disorder, eating disorder were still females. So we're saying that we're seeing more males uh, and we are, there are in the statistics, there's more male, but they are not seeking treatment or are they seeking treatment? There's something that's quite concerning as well. And then I have numbers here in terms of the cost uh, of eating disorders. And when you want to have funding from funding bodies and, and government, you need to talk about money. And when we look at that, like we 84 million um, now, 84 million, the impact is up is now $84 million. If you look at the whole, and, and this is looking more broadly at the, the costs that are incurred by the person with the eating disorders, as you can see, the carers, um, employers, where there is decreased productivity and different things like that. So there is a significant amount of money that is spent around eating disorders, or that, that the cost of eating disorders is, is quite significant. When we look at eating disorders, most of the literature is going to talk about the medical comorbidities, and I have a few examples here, and psychiatric comorbidities. But I feel like saying nowhere, but I'm going to say it's exceptionally rare that we see any link. Like if you have somebody, if you had a client with some of these comorbidities, of course there's going to be an impact on their occupational performance and their function. But that's not there in the field of eating disorder yet, which is mind blowing. We're starting to see a couple of references, but very, very few that say it impacts all areas of life. And then when you start looking a bit more, then you have roles and meaningful occupation. You have OT things here, work, study, self-care, shopping. They had a lot of, they had a, a, been a lot of, of emphasis on meal preparation and eating a meal when it's much more than that but I feel I feel like that's it has been our way in to have some credential in terms of of the role that we can play but this is making my life uh, making me so happy we're starting to see things that are using occupational therapy language and there is um the, the last part here with um the impact on in terms of participating in social situations that are involved in food engaging in managing meaningful roles ability to cope emotional regulation sensory processing ot this is from a very very recent study that a colleague of mine sent to me sent me yesterday so i was the timing was perfect because i could put it there um and have that in the reference list and danny i'm happy to share all my slides as well but when we look at this, to me, what comes obvious is this. Everything that's there fits into an occupational therapy model. And I've put the POP here. I could have put the model female occupation. And I think I, maybe I didn't because I, I, I felt like Danny would say, no, no, that's not true, Danny, because Danny knows that I work with the model female occupation a lot. I love it. But if we look at that from any occupational therapy lens, honestly, there are functional impacts everywhere. Physiological, cognitive, spiritual, everything has a functional impact. But that is not recognized enough in the field of eating disorders. It's eating disorder haven't changed that much. The same functional impacts have been there for decades. This is clear. There is a clear, I don't know why people don't want that people apart from us don't see that, that functional impact. And I think we need to, bring that language to the, the world of eating disorders. Um, a very well-known pediatrician that I work with in Canada used to say that eating disorders is like trying to make a puzzle with white pieces or blank pieces. You don't know where to start. You don't know like where, where does it start? Where does it end? And he used to say, the way to engage somebody in treatment is to capture the interest. What is more occupational therapy than that? Or when he said that to me, it's like, oh my God, he's talking about the model of human occupation. It's about finding their interest. That's going to increase their volition, that sense of personal causation and having control, but healthy control instead of controlling your food all the time. You can make choices about things that are meaningful for you that you like doing, that you want to do as well. So already there was this sort of 
interest in, in what is occupational therapy, but not clearly as, as clearly as it should have been. But thankfully, the amazing Laura Locke from the UK again has um, developed to, I think to date, it's the only occupational therapy specific assessment tool for eating disorders. Um, the EMSA. She has developed that. It has been published. You have that in the reference list as well, uh, where it's really, and it has really good, uh, she's done good research around that. It's the, the EMSA is used in parallel with, um, with a, a 10 session uh, group that she was doing as well, a 10 session meal pre preparation training program. But you have something that is very, very occupational therapy specific. And at the same time, when you look at the items, she was very clever in the way that she's organized that because it talks to the broader field of eating disorder. It talks about, you know, like eating, preparing things, but she's she's using language that will appeal to other healthcare professionals, part of the team. But at the same time, it allows us to come in and say, this is an occupational therapy specific assessment. So I think, I genuinely think that her work has, has shifted uh, in a good way are the perception that people have about occupational therapy so for that I think I'm going to be totally grateful to her um oh my god Danny I'm going to run out of time uh quickly I'm going to go quickly contribution of uh, eating uh, of occupational therapy to eating disorders that's one um, of the study that I wanted to share with you that was done uh, by Samantha Lawler, a fourth year occupational therapy student at Deakin, where she was looking at what you have statistics around eating disorder, which we talked about. And what she had in the middle was that the look at the, she was looking at the treatment and there's nothing that's occupational therapy specific there. CBTE, family-based therapy, um, it's all, a, they're great and they're evidence-based and they work and it's important to use them, but there's nothing about occupational therapy. The role of occupational therapist is misunderstood. It's always very generalist. And a lot of OTs that work in the field of eating disorders end up being a mental health clinician doing CBT, CBTE, FBT, all this BT, without necessarily doing occupational therapy specific interventions. We're seeing that more now, but it's, it's very rare that you're going to see specific OT interventions happen in a multi eating disorder multidisciplinary team. So in her study, what Samantha was, was interested in was really to understand what it was like to be an OT working in eating disorders for um, in, in OTs working in Australia and New Zealand and what work, what doesn't work and things like that. So she did interviews. Um, we had 12 people in Australia, four people in New Zealand um, taught, telling us their stories. Unsurprisingly, they had good stories, bad stories, and very ugly stories to tell us about, you know, sometimes what's fantastic is to see what you see from an OT lens. The engagement in meaningful occupation was great, but then the very limited opportunities and the resistance from others to actually do OT things and OT intervention was a problem. They People don't see what OT see. And that was a, a, a problem, like the changes in occupational engagement going unnoticed because the eating disorder symptoms themselves might not have changed enough. So it sort of completely ignores or devalues the roles of, of OT. Um, they talked about the environment a lot, which is also OT. There were the relationship that the person developed with the environment and that sort of interaction with the person in the environment was obvious in the intervention, but not to the medical team or the multidisciplinary team. They were seeing that they were using the OT process for them really clearly. You start with the assessment and you have all the different steps of the occupational therapy process and they could see changes in or progression and changes in the eating disorder presentation and an improvement in terms of the recovery. But they felt and they felt that the OT process were giving them some structure as well. They also said that we need to do more. There needs to be much more training more more awareness, more training, more publications, more work needs to be done. And that's what they were saying. We have, but we need to do much more than that. Um, but we have a, a bit of a louder voice in Australia anyway, and I would say in the UK as well. Um, in Australia, we have the Medicare benefit schedules, and there's been new items just for eating disorders that were developed recently, and OTs were in there. So OTs are starting to be in there as well. 
And one of the things that I say all the time everywhere is that recovery does not happen in someone's, someone's office. It happens out there in the real world, and that's where OTs shine. We train to do that. So I think this is what we're starting to see a bit of a shift in the world of um, eating disorders around that. Quickly, uh, another area of growth, one area of growth for occupation, I think for occupational therapy and occupational therapists and eating disorders is around sensory processing. Um, this is again a study from an honor student, Abby Lynch, who did um, a systematic review. And really this little figure that you have here, when you apply this to eating disorders, it gives you so many answers to so many complex questions. She had her question here. We talked about sensory approach, dental invasive. There is evidence, growing evidence, around the role of interoception and eating disorders. Um, but she really wanted to look at the literature and what was there. We didn't find much, but what we found, if I summarised that in, in sort of one slide and I could um, send more information again, is that when you look at these different sensory preferences, at the bottom, the sensory sensitive and the sensory avoidant are people with anorexia nervosa. Once we understand that, it's much easier to, yes, it makes sense for them to avoid food because there might be a sensory thing happening. And then at the top part, where there is sensory seeking, you have people with bulimia nervosa. It takes much more food, for example, for them to feel something. It's the same, it's not just with food, but with other emotions as well. And then what we're hoping is to have to use sensory approaches to bring them back to something that's a bit more balanced in the middle as well. So we have, again, really great information about what OTs can do in terms of um, uh, the role of using sensory um, processing, sensory intervention and things that we know. We know about that. We trained for that. And other area of growth is for us is really to use functional assessment that we usually use in more of a physical health part of, of our practice, bring the, the functional assessment for uh, and bring that to the to people with an eating disorder to really understand that functional impact. So my summary or my conclusion is that we need to give uh, also uh, future consideration must be given to the composition of the multidisciplinary teams. We need to have OTs everywhere because we can bring this unique lens, you know that you're all OTs, you understand that, but the world of eating disorders does not understand that just yet. Like I said earlier, there is a shift, which is fantastic, but we need to really do more. Sensory processing, functional assessments, I think really need to be there as well. And we need to publish more. And I'm, I'm guilty of that. I have a pile of manuscripts that are almost done. But we need to do that. We need to, my call to arms is to get together and be loud and proud and make noise about what we're doing, talk about occupation, and remember that recovery does not happen in somebody's office, and, and connect and work together and share your amazing clinical work with people like Danny and I and others who work in, in academia to have that, to disseminate and translate all that great knowledge that you have. That's it, Danny, I'm done. If you want to get in touch, please get in touch.